The National Football League has this fun thing called a salary cap. It keeps all of the 32 teams in check, giving guidelines for how much they can pay players. It was introduced in 1994 and was set at $34.6 million. Today, the salary cap has grown almost six times that amount. Let's take a look. The NFL has a hard salary cap, meaning teams can't go over it. Other leagues with a soft salary cap, such as the NBA, receive fines called a luxury tax if they go over the cap limit. We made a video explaining the NBA salary cap. You can click the link in the top right or there's a link down below in the description. The NFL's hard cap is different in the fact that a team pretty much doesn't even have the ability to go over the cap. All contracts signed between teams and players have to go through the league office. And if the contract doesn't fit within the team's salary cap, the league says, nah, try again. Do you subscribe to the numbers behind? Because if you don't, next time you go to the store, a tumbo is going to smack your groceries to the ground. The NFL salary cap is tied to the NFL revenue stream. As the NFL makes more money, the cap will increase and give the team the ability to pay players more. The salary cap has risen over time as revenues increased, but it did take a small hit due to the pandemic and was lowered about $16 million for the 2021 season to $182.5 million. The cap only applies to players, it does not include coaches or trainer salaries. The salary cap doesn't just tell teams how much they can spend, it also tells them how much they have to spend. We will touch on this later on in the video, but the amount teams pay a player and the salary cap hit they take are often very different numbers. So in order for the amount players are paid to be somewhat in line with the salary cap, every NFL team has to exceed 90% of their salary cap in actual cash spendings. This is average over a three year period, so you can drop below for one year as long as the average stays above 90% for that three year period. This is strictly cash paid out, which is almost always different than the team's actual salary cap hit for that year. If a team was under the minimum cash spending threshold, they would be forced to pay out the remaining money to the players on their roster. If you're a little confused with that, hopefully it'll make more sense later on in the video. The entire NFL also has a floor according to the collective bargaining agreement which requires that all NFL teams combined must spend 95% of the salary cap in cash over a three year average. This means that the average spending across the NFL has to exceed 95% of the cap from 2021 to 2023. Just like the individual team floor, if they end up below this, the NFL pays the remaining amount directly to the players' pockets. Contract structure is critical to a team's salary cap. When a team and a player agree to a new contract, it is almost never a neat calculation to determine what the player's cap hit is in any given year. For example, a four-year $24 million contract is most likely not paying that player $6 million each year, nor is the cap hit $6 million each year. The contract is usually structured to pay the player more on the back end of the deal, as teams expect the salary cap to rise over time and it allows them more wiggle room in the first year or two. So what about the last couple years of the contract? Doesn't it put heavy strain on the team? Well, here's the thing about the National Football League. The teams have the right to release a player at any time. Meaning, before the NFL player enters the later years of his contract, the team can release them and owe them nothing. You might be thinking, hold on, a team can just release a player even though they have a contract with them and not pay them any of it? Yep. Yeah, they can. And they do. The way a player can avoid this is by having more guaranteed money in their contract, which has been the standard in the NBA, but it's still not the norm in the NFL. Although we are seeing more and more stars getting a lot of guaranteed money up front. With teams being able to cut a player whenever they want, why would a player be okay with signing a back-heavy contract if there's a big chance they won't see that money at the end? The solution? Signing bonuses. Signing bonuses will count against the cap, but the team can attribute the cost of the bonus over the years of the contract instead of all of it counting in the first year. So for example, 
If a player signs a three-year contract with a $15 million signing bonus, that player will receive the $15 million all that year, but the salary cap hit will be $5 million over the next three years of the contract. If it's a contract extension, it'll be spread out over the remaining years of the current contract plus the years of the new contract. Signing bonuses are guaranteed no matter if the player is released, traded, or injured, making them very enticing for players. This ties back to what we went over before, with teams being required to have a cash spend of at least 90% of their salary cap. If a player is released, traded, or retires, the remaining signing bonus all hits the salary cap the next season. However, there is an important caveat to this we see often. Many teams will wait until after June 1st to waive players because the team has the ability to stretch the hit over two seasons instead of having it pay out all in the next year. If a different team picks up that player, whether through trade or from waivers, the new team doesn't have to pay a dime of the signing bonus because it was already paid out by that original team. There is a rule in place that doesn't allow players to take their signing bonuses and then retire. The NFL calls this the cash check and lickety split rule. Just kidding, it doesn't have a name. Owners over the years became worried that they would give these players millions of dollars and then the player would just bounce. So they included language in the contract that pretty much says the player has to return all or some of their signing bonus if the player fails to practice or play for the team. Contracts often have incentives for players to earn bonuses. These incentives are categorized in two different ways, likely to be earned or LTBE and not likely to be earned, NLTBE, which I mean, it seems pretty unmotivational to call an incentive unlikely to be earned, but take that up with the NFL. Likely to be earned incentives include performance-based goals that use the previous season as a benchmark. For example, a running back might have rushed for 1,200 yards last season, and in his new contract, he has a cash incentive to rush for 1,200 yards. This would be considered likely to be earned since the running back has already achieved this. Likely to be earned incentives also include cash incentives for off-season workouts and mini camps. Pretty much anything that is likely to happen. If there is a performance-based incentive that the player did not complete the previous year, it is categorized as not likely to be earned. Which once again, does not sound very motivational if I was a player. You know what would be extremely motivational? Supporting a new growing YouTube channel by making that like button go blue and oh, it goes black now. Interesting. The key difference between these two incentives is how they affect the salary cap. The incentives that are deemed not likely to be earned do not count against a team's salary cap, while the incentives that are likely to be earned do count against it. Although all NFL teams have the same salary cap base, you'll notice that all teams have a slightly different salary cap every year. This is because the NFL allows teams to have an adjusted cap. Those fun, unlikely and likely cash incentives come into play here. Both likely and unlikely to be earned incentives can have an effect on a team's salary cap. If you have a player who had an incentive that was likely to be earned but didn't end up achieving it, that incentive amount is now accredited to the next year's cap. For example, if a quarterback had a $200,000 incentive to rush for 1,000 yards, but he only rushed for 800, the team's salary cap the following season would get a $200,000 credit. And vice versa for a player who earned incentive that was unlikely to be earned. It will be charged against the team's salary cap the next year for the incentive amount. Teams also have the ability to roll over cap space from one year to the next. For example, if the Dallas Cowboys were $10 million under the salary cap at the end of one season, they could roll over that amount to the next season, giving them an extra $10 million in cap space. You might hear the term dead cap space a lot when contracts are being discussed. To put this term simply, it means how much the team is paying players who don't play for them anymore, taking up salary cap space for no benefit to the team. This term can get pretty dang complicated, so let's go over two main ways to have dead cap space. The first deals with traded players, and the second is for cut players. First, let's go over an example of dead cap space with a trade. Remember those signing bonuses we talked about earlier? Big time important here. Let's say, hypothetically, 
you have a player who signed a four-year contract for $156 million in 2020. When he signed the contract, he received a $27 million signing bonus because his agent was a homie. If in 2021, before his new contract even begins, the player became unhappy and requested a trade, that team would take a big hit in dead cap if they ended up moving him. The team would carry a dead cap hit of $21.6 million. We get this number by taking the original signing bonus of 27 million, divide that up by the term of the contract plus one since he signed it the year before, making it five years, bringing a cap hit of $5.4 million a year. Since they already took the cap hit from one of those years, we can subtract 5.4 million from the 27 million, giving us a total of 21.6 million that would hit the cap the next season. Or in other words, 21.6 million of dead cap. But what if no one wanted a player because they didn't want to take on his contract? What if the team had to make a decision in either keeping the player on and paying him a high amount, or cutting him so they could save some money overall but take a large hit in dead cap? Well, let's look at an example of cutting a player and how it affects dead cap. Let's take the largest dead cap hit from a cut player ever, Todd Gurley, who was cut by the Rams in 2020. Todd Gurley signed an extension off his rookie deal in 2018 for four years, $57.4 million. The Rams put themselves in a bit of a predicament when they headed into the 2020 season with a roster well over the salary cap limit. They had some big decisions to make. They had to either keep Gurley on the contract he inked a few years back or cut him to save some cap space overall for that year, but take on a lot of dead cap. They chose the latter and he was cut. The issue for the Rams was that Mr. Gurley had 21.95 freaking million dollars guaranteed at signing, and they had only paid him 1.8 million as his contract was heavily backloaded. Guaranteed money is different from signing bonuses. If a player is traded, that guaranteed money is transferred to the new team. When a player is cut, that team has to pay the full amount that that player was originally guaranteed. The LA Rams took on a dead cap hit of $20.15 million. They did cut him after June 1st, so they were able to spread this out over two seasons, but this was still the biggest dead cap hit ever from a cut. The NFL salary cap has many moving pieces and it can get very complicated very quickly. Understanding how the salary cap works though is crucial to better understanding how your team is doing off the field. Learning about your team's salary cap can show you just how well your team's front office is doing, giving you some analytical insight on how talented they are in structuring deals and keeping players around. Oh wow. <laughs>